Okay, <coughs> so we uh, this is the second lecture of uh, algebraic geometry. So we introduced the fine algebraic sets. So these are subsets, uh, uh, zero set of S in a k, where S is a some set of polynomials, so we will write a n in n variables, <coughs> and the uh, set of S just means it's uh, the set of all uh, points p in a n such that f of p is equal to zero for all f in S. We had seen that uh, these the fine algebraic sets uh, uh, also can be uh, can be just obtained as zero sets of ideals. So, uh, because uh, the zero set of S is equal to the zero set of the ideal generated by S, and we had also introduced the ideal of an affine algebraic set. So, if X the subset, we have the ideal of X which is um, just the set of all polynomials f <coughs> in k x1 to xn such that f restricted uh, to x is the zero polynomial. And say, if we assume that x is an affine algebraic set, We can consider this. So we have a, <coughs> a way how to associate to an ideal, its zero set, which is a fine algebraic set. And we have um, also uh, the possibility of associating to a fine algebraic set an ideal. And this ideal is somehow associated in a natural canonical way to X. So you can somehow hope that uh, the properties of the ideal I mean the algebraic properties of the ideal of X are closely related to the geometric properties of X. We will later see that this is the case. <coughs> um, and then uh, what else did we have? We had the Hilbert basis theorem. Which, uh, I mean, we use in the form that uh, we have that k x1 to xn is Neuterian. So that means, in particular, one way of formulating is that every ideal in this ring is finitely generated. And uh, as, a as a corollary, Uh, we would get that uh, every fine algebraic set is a zero set of finitely many polynomials. So this is just um, uh, just clear. Um, you know, if uh, you you have that, uh, so we know that X is a zero set of some ideal. And um, this ideal is finitely generated because every ideal in kx1 to xn is finitely generated. So we can write um, i equal to the ideal generated by some elements f1 to fr for some r. And then we have that x is the zero set of the ideal generated by the fi, which is the same as the zero, a zero set of the fi. 
Okay. So, <coughs> we in our original definition we allowed zero sets of arbitrary sets of polynomials, but in the end one only needs finite d many, so it somehow feels a bit more uh, comfortable. So <coughs> now, who's that? <laughs> now uh, I want to give an application of a geometric application in some sense of this Hilbert basis theorem. I already uh, hinted at it. <laughs> uh, so um, the statement is that every affine algebraic set is a finite union of uh, affine algebraic sets which cannot be further decomposed. So we'll have to see precisely what I mean by that. So there is some kind of way how you can really say that an affine algebraic set is a union of finitely many pieces. And these pieces will be called the irreducible components. Okay, so, so. Irreducible components. So you know, you know, for instance, that if you if in A two, if you take the zero set of x times y, where x and y are the coordinates, then you know we know this is the zero set of z of x union the zero set of y. If we look at the real points, then it would look, uh, this one would be the union of two lines, the horizontal and the vertical line. And you can evidently see that this thing in some sense has two pieces. Hmm? Um, and somehow we want to see that it's always like that. And one, what one cannot see here immediately, but which turns out to be true, is that these pieces cannot be further decomposed. One cannot write it as a union of uh, 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 affine algebraic sets. I mean, not, uh, or at least not a finitely many. <coughs> so, um, so in order to make sense of this statement and uh, prove it, we want to formulate it in a topological way. So we have the Zariski topology. In terms of this, we can say what we mean by something being irreducible, and then we want to show uh, this statement about the irreducible components. So let's see. So uh, formulate it, it more generally. Uh, as a topological statement. Then data such uh, statements can be applied in slightly more, slightly larger generality. So, um, so we say definition. A topological space X is called reducible <coughs> if we can write it as a union of two closed subsets, none of which is equal to X. So if X is equal to X1 union X2, where X1 and X2 are closed subsets And x1 and x2 are, are strictly contained in x. So to say it, um, so for instance here, this is evidently the case. You know, this zxy is the union of z of x and z of y, and both of them are closed subsets. And none of them is equal to this union. <clears throat> so, um, 
And then what we really are interested in is irreducible, which is the opposite. So something is called reducible, uh, irreducible if it's not reducible. So explicitly, this says that, um, I mean, because we use it most likely in that way, um, so if x, so if x is, ir is ir irreducible, if x is the union of x1 union x2 with uh, the xi in x closed subsets, then it follows that x is equal to x1 or x is equal to x2. So that is what it means to be irreducible. Okay, that's just the definition. So maybe I should say that, um, you know, this uh, topological statements we will apply to uh, affine algebraic varieties with the Zariski topology. And if you look at it in the kind of usual sense, if you look at subsets of Rn with the usual topology, these kind of concepts make essentially no sense. I mean, you, there's, if, for instance, in a Hausdorff topological space, uh, the only irreducible subsets are the points. Okay, so it's not such an uh, exciting concept uh, if you use uh, this in the things you usually study, but uh, the Zariski topology is very strange, and this concept does make sense. So we mark. So one thing is that, for instance, um, if x is irreducible, and u subset x and open subset, um, then it follows. So, and u is non-empty. So any non-empty open subset of an irreducible space, um, then the closure of u, then u is dense in x. So if you have a, an irreducible topological space, then any non-empty open subset is dense. Um, and this is uh, easy, because we can certainly write x equal to x minus u, which is a closed subset because u is open, union the closure of u, which is also a closed subset. And, uh, you know, as x is irreducible, uh, it follows that x is equal to x minus u, or x is equal to the closure of u. But u was non-empty, so this is obviously not true. This is not true. So it follows that x is equal to the closure of u, and u is dense in x. And in a similar way, uh, you can show it's uh, an easy exercise. So under these assumptions, so also u is irreducible. So if uh, x is irreducible and u a non-empty open subset, then u is also irreducible. And you know, it's an easy exercise in the definitions to see that. <clears throat> okay, so so now we give some examples in the so examples. So first, as I said, a point P in A N is irreducible. 
because if you write it as a union of two uh, closed subsets, then one of them must be the point. And uh, <coughs> uh, then we also see that the zero set of x, y in A2 is reducible. Because uh, it's the union of z of x and z of y. And you can easily see that none of these two is equal to x, to the zero set of these two. Take the point uh, uh, whatever. 1, 0, it will lie in 1. If you take the point 0, 1, it lies in the other. <coughs> and so uh, this is reducible. Now we want to show uh, the statement that I made about irreducible components. We want to, to show that uh, a fine algebraic sets can be written as a union of finitely many irreducible affine algebraic sets. Okay, where I call an affine algebraic set irreducible as it's irreducible as a topological space. And again, to uh, make it more generally applicable, we will prove a slightly more general statement in a topological uh, concept, uh, con context. So we uh, first define something which will be true for a fine algebraic sets, and then we prove that uh, the statement about decomposition into irreducible components holds for each such thing that we define. So and this is the following statement, definition. A topological space is called Neuterian if the following holds uh, for <coughs> if every descending chain so x contains x1 contains x2 uh, so if an infinite chain like this of closed subsets becomes stationary. So that means from some point onwards they are all equal. For some n. Okay, so this is obviously very similar to the definition of a Neuterian ring. So there we also have some chain condition. But for a Neuterian ring, we had the ascending chain condition. So if you have a, a chain of ideals where they become larger and larger, then uh, they will become stationary. And here we have it for closed subsets, but they become smaller and smaller. But if you think of it, this should somehow correspond, and we'll see that because uh, if for a fine algebraic sets, <coughs> if we have a, an inclusion I1 is contained in I2, then the zero set of I2 is contained in I1. We have the inclusion gets reversed, so that an ascending chain will become a descending chain. So it's a, definition is precisely made in such a way to match uh, via this kind of duality, uh, the Neuterian Nietzsche for rings. Okay, so I make some mark. So first, any subspace of a Neuterian topological space Topological is Neuterian. So we have a subspace, we have a topological space, 
we are called the subspace Y of a Newtonian topological space X is Newtonian. So subspace means it's a subset with the induced topology, as usual. So <clears throat> this is uh, almost obvious. Let's see. So assume we have a descending chain. So take a descending chain in Y. So Y contains Y1, contains Y2, a descending chain of closed subsets. Well, you know, the subspace topology means precisely that I can take these closed subsets as the intersection of Y with closed subsets of X. So then we have that for all I, YI can be written as X intersected with XI where xi in x is a closed subset. So now one could uh, uh, be tempted to say that the xi form a descending chain in x, but there's, this is actually not true. But uh, with a tiny modification, they do. So we put xi prime to be the intersection for all j smaller or equal to i, so from so one smaller or equal to j, smaller or equal to the given i, so for all j from 1 to i, of the xi. Then it is clear that if I take uh, xi prime intersected y, this is the same as x intersected. This is the same as yi. Because you know that the intersections of the xi with y, with, the, with y form a descending chain. So if we, you know, do, if we first intersect them in this way, we get the same intersection with y. And now these xi prime form a descending chain in x. So then x descending chain of closed subsets of x, so it becomes stationary. So for some n, we have that x n prime is equal to x n plus 1 prime. Well, and as y is just, as the y i are just uh, given as intersection of uh, y with this thing, with these, so then the odds become stationary. Thus, also, uh, this chain becomes stationary. So these are some very easy observations. So I also need to second statement to now finally come back to our fine algebraic sets. So the claim is that An is in a Terran topological space. And thus by 1, every affine algebraic set, and in fact any subset of a n with induced topology is Neuterian. So we, this is, uh, we only have to prove this statement. The second follows by 1 because we have uh, the statement that any subspace of a Neuterian uh, topological space is Neuterian. So how's that? 
Well, and this is precisely the story with the chains of closed subsets corresponding to um, chains in the other direction of ideals. So let say x contains x1 contains x2 be a chain. So x is the n after all of closed subsets in a n. Well then Um, I can look at the ideals of these closed close subsets. So the ideal of x1 will be contained in the ideal of x2 is an, is an ascending chain of, uh, of ideals in kx1 x n. So we know it becomes stationary. Thus, we have that say it becomes stationary. So that means I of xn is equal to I of xn plus 1. Um, and But note that we have seen that for a uh, close, for an affine algebraic set, the zero set of the ideal is equal to the set itself. So thus also uh, xn, which is the zero set of uh, i of xn, is equal to xn plus 1. So this proves that uh, An is in a Unitarian topological space. We have a chain. Our given chain of ideals of, of closed subsets becomes stationary. And so whatever we have said about uh, uh, Unitarian topological spaces applies to a fine algebraic sets. And also to open subsets of affine algebraic sets, whatever we want. Now we want to make a statement about these irreducible components. So well, I, this is a theorem. Uh, and also definition. So we prove that something exists and we then give it a name. So let X be a, a Unitarian topological space. Then there are two statements. First, X uh, is, a, a finite, is, is a union of finitely many irreducible topological spaces. So I can write x is equal to x1 union Do I want this? 
maybe irreducible, I don't think I want like this, irreducible closed subsets. Okay. And uh, the second statement is that in a suitable sense, this decomposition is unique. You know, there's some stupid thing you can do. You can always add to this decomposition some closed subset which is contained in one of the xi's. So you can add as many additional components as you want by just taking something very small which fits into one of them. But if you don't do such a stupid thing, so if you don't allow some of these components to be in contained in another one, then this decomposition is unique. So if we require that um, xi is not contained in xj for i different from j, then uh, this decomposition is unique up to reordering. So let's see. <coughs> so <coughs> I mean, you can. Uh, so we want to see. I mean, the most uh, important thing is the first part. We want to see that we can write x as a union of finitely many irreducible closed subsets. So let's start with the proof. So we first show. Uh, uh, in some sense, the existence, so basically one. So it's enough. So for the existence of a decomposition like this, also, if we want to have this property, it's enough to show the existence of any such decomposition without this property. Let me say it more precisely. So it's enough to show the existence of a decomposition x is equal to x1 union xr with xi irreducible closed subsets. So for the existence part of 2, which means there exists such a decomposition where the xi are not contained in the xj, is trivial. If some xi is contained in another xj, we just throw it away. And the union of all the xi's is still x, because after all, the thing we threw away was contained in another one. So, so by removing the xi with xi contained in xj for i different from j, we get a decomposition as in 2. So x equal to the union and uh, xi is not contained in xj for i different from j. So this is kind of clear. Now we want to prove just that we have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets. And this we do by an indirect argument. We assume such a thing does not exist, and we get to a contradiction. So assume x does not have a decomposition into finitely many 
irreducible closed subsets. So we make this assumption, we will want to come to a contradiction. So one thing, if x doesn't have such a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets, certainly x is not irreducible, because otherwise we could take x equal to x as the decomposition. So in particular, x is reducible. So we can write x x as union of x1 and y1, where x1 and y1 are closed subsets. And it can also not be that both x1 and y1 have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets, because otherwise we just take the finitely many for this plus the finitely many for this, and we still have finitely many for x. So one of the two does not have a decomposition into finitely many closed irreducible closed subsets. So one of the and one of the two and uh, you know whose x1 and y1 is just names that we give. So say y1, say x1 uh, does not have a decomposition into um, finitely many, many irreducible closed subsets. But if you look at it now, this is precisely the, comp the uh, assumption we made about x. We made that in the only assumption we made about x is that it does not. Ah, yeah. So I wrote something else. I said x does not have a decomposition, and I wrote it does. Okay. But uh, obviously the assumption was that. Otherwise, how do we bring it to a contradiction? So we assume that x does not have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets. Uh, then, in particular, x is reducible. And now we find that one of the two does not have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets. This is precisely the assumption we made about x. So whatever we have deduced about x, we also deduce of x1. So we can, again, write x1 as a union of two things, one of which does not have a decomposition, and so on. So, <coughs> so we just repeat the argument with it. So this is the same assumption, same uh, statement as the assumption about x. So we get, can repeat the argument. So repeat the argument. <clears throat> then we get that x1 can be written as uh, x2 union y2, where x2 does not have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets. So we get, we can again apply to this. So we get inductively that in a descending chain, x contains x1, contains x2, and so on. And if you look at it here, <coughs> so this, I mean, I haven't been careful in writing it. x is the union of x1 and y1. But you know, part of the story is it's the union of two such things, none of which is equal to x. You know? We have in particular also that x1 is different from x and y1 is different from x, because being, reduce, being reducible means that you can write it as a union of closed subsets, of, of two closed subsets, none of which is equal to x. And the same applies here. 
So this means here x1 is not equal to x, x2 is not equal to x1, and so on. So we get a descending chain where at each step it gets strictly smaller. So that means the, station, the, the chain is not stationary. And this is a contradiction to, uh, uh, to, uh, our, to x being Newtonian. So we can conclude that uh, we were wrong in the beginning, and x does indeed have a decomposition into finitely many irreducible closed subsets. So we get a statement of 1. OK. So <clears throat> now the second is uh, some sense. So you see, and that's somehow how one usually proves results using this notoriety that you somehow make such a chain and bring things to contradiction. It's a very, it always leads to some indirect argument which is very non-constructive. I mean, it actually gives you no idea how you would find these components. It just is an existence result. But this is what, uh, uh, what this assumption will give you. So let's prove two. I mean, or rather the uniqueness. So we assume now we have a decomposition into x1 union xr such that no xi is contained in, in, in another xj. Now we have seen that we can get that. And uh, Actually, we assume we have two such decompositions. Y S, the two compositions as in two. So X is the union of the XI. It's also union of the YJ. These are all irreducible closed subsets, and none of the xi is contained in another xj, and none of the yi is contained in another yj. So, and we want to show that these are the same things. r is equal to s, and the yi are per permutation of the xj. So, we can certainly write, can write xi is the intersection of uh, xi with x, which is the same as the intersection as um, the union i equals 1 to s of uh, xi intersected, I couldn't call it j equals 1 to s, yj. No? Because after all, the union of these is just x, and so this is certainly the case. But now, <coughs> xi is irreducible, and these are closed subsets. So it follows that if xi is equal to the union of these finitely many, it must be equal to one of them. It follows that xi is equal to xi intersected yj for some j. But what does that mean? It means that xi is contained in yj. So we find that each that xi is contained in yj. In the same, I mean, each xi is contained in some yj. In the same way, we can exchange the role of the x and y here. So similarly, 
uh, we have that yj is contained in xk for some k. So we have this chain that xi is contained in yj is contained in xk. But then, obviously, xi is contained in xk, and we have excluded that. The only possibility how this can be the case is that xi is equal to xk, and actually that k is equal to i. So it's only possible if uh, i is equal to k. But in this case, you see that uh, yj is squeezed here in between. It's, it contains this, and it's contained in the same. So they are equal. And yj is equal to xi. So we have that each xi is equal to some yj. In the same way, you can exchange the old each yj is equal to some xi. And this just means that the yj's are just the permutation of the xi's. You know, each of, you know, we have here r different things. We have here s different things. But each of them is equal to one of these, and each of them is equal to one of these. So the number of things is the same, and they are just permutations of each other. So R is equal to S, and um, the XIs or YJs are a permutation of the XIs. OK, so this was quite, um, OK, so here this is actually quite simple. So we just use this condition that we put here, if one is contained in the other, they must be equal. Then one just uses this together with this condition of irreducibility here, uh, and one gets a diminutive. Okay. So <clears throat> we will. I mean, the reason why we uh, introduce these irreducible uh, algebraic sets is that it's from some point onwards, we will mostly just consider those. So in, so in the future, but not immediately in the future, but most of the time, we will mostly consider only irreducible algebraic sets. And that's OK, because we know that you know, if we have an, a general affine algebraic set, it's just a finite union of these. So if we know all the pieces, we know uh, the thing. No, it's not such a thing. And so we uh, consider it important enough that we give it a name. So definition, an affine variety is an irreducible affine algebraic set. And I might um, <clears throat> see in a moment. Uh, and now one thing <clears throat> I had mentioned when I talked about the ideal of an affine algebraic set, uh, that because the ideal is kind of associated in a canonical way to the affine algebraic set, one should have that the uh, algebraic properties of the ideal should somehow reflect some geometric properties of the affine algebraic set. And the first instance we have here 
and a fine algebraic set is irreducible if and only if its ideal is a prime ideal. Okay. This is a, say, proposition. Let x n be in a fine algebraic set. Then x is irreducible if and only if uh, the ideal of x is a prime ideal. Okay, so we have some, at least we have a kind of somewhat interesting concept in commutative algebra, which is related to this geometric property of being irreducible. And this is actually quite simple if you think of it. So we have these two directions. How would we want to prove that? So we assume, uh, say, x is irreducible, and then we have to show it's a prime ideal. So uh, recall the definition of a prime ideal, so an ideal. So that means ix is an ideal. And in addition, if uh, a product f times g, where f and g are elements of uh, kx1 to xn, so prime ideal in kx1 to xn, if f and g are two polynomials, I take their product. If that lies in Ix, then it follows that f is in Ix or g is in Ix. This is the definition of a prime ideal, I mean, once it's an ideal. So let x be irreducible. Well, and then we take uh, f and g, uh, some polynomials. such that f times g lies in the ideal of x. So, and then our task is to prove that one of the two already lies in the ideal of x. Well, that's very simple. So, if, so the ideal of x is a set of all uh, polynomials which vanish on x. So it means that if I take uh, f times g vanishes on the whole of x, or saying it in a different way, we have that x is contained in the zero set of f times g. Huh? And so in particular, we can write x to be, in similar fashion as here, to be x intersected the zero set of f uh, so, and recall that this is just the zero set of f union the zero set of g. And from this one can already see that these concepts should be related. Huh? So, um, uh, therefore, we can write x as uh, the union of x intersected the zero set of f, union x intersected the zero set of g. No, because the union of c of f and g of g contains uh, x. So x is, union, is equal to that. So these are two closed subsets of x. So, so two closed subsets of x. And x is irreducible, so one of them must be equal to x. So it follows x is equal to x intersected z of f, or x is equal to x intersected z of g. But what does it mean? If x is equal to x intersected z of f, it means that x is contained in the zero set of f, which means that f lies in the ideal of x.
and this was precisely what we had to see. So this is the one direction. <coughs> and now the other direction is not much uh, different, except that we decide to do it indirect. So we assume uh, that x is reducible, so not irreducible, and we have to show that ix is not a prime ideal. So I assume x reducible, show ix is not a prime ideal. Well, so again, we just spell out the definitions and then we cannot avoid proving the result. So, so we assume it's reducible. So x is equal to x1 union x2, where the xi are closed subsets of x, and none of them is equal to x. So we have the zero set of the ideal of x1. We know that this is equal to x1. And this is contained in, uh, in x, which is the zero set of the ideal of x. And uh, you know, it's not only contained, it's strictly contained. So we have this, and same for x2. So we have that, uh, you know, as we have the strict inclusion like this, we must have the strict inclusion the other way around between the ideals. You know, because if the ideals were equal, then the zero sets could not be different. So it follows that i of x1 contains strictly i of x. And in the same way, obviously, ix2 constrains strictly i of x. So we can find an element f in i of x1, which does not lie here. And we find, can find a g here, which does not, not lie here. So let f in i of x1 on i of x and g in i of x2 without i of x. Well, so here we have found two, found two elements which do not lie in i of x, but the claim is obviously that their product lies in i of x. And so it's not a prime ideal. So obviously, if I take uh, f times g, so f vanishes on x1. g vanishes on x2. So f times g vanishes on x1 union x2. So z so vanishes. just as a union of the zero sets. And this is equal to x. And as uh, the ideal of x is just the zero set, uh, is just uh, uh, the set of all functions which vanish on x, it means that f of times g is an element in the ideal of x. So we have indeed found uh, two elements, f and g, which do not lie in the ideal of x and their product does, so i of x is not a prime ideal. Okay, and so this proves um, this statement. So in the moment, this doesn't help us so very much to decide whether a given uh, a fine algebraic set is irreducible. So one thing we can see as an example is that 
A n is irreducible. That was maybe not so clear before, but now it's clear because we know that uh, uh, An, what is the ideal of An? So what are all the polynomials which vanish on the whole of k to the n? I mean, if a polynomial vanishes on the whole of k to the n precisely when it's zero. And we know that uh, kx1 to x n you know, doesn't have zero divisors or anything, so zero is a prime ideal. And so, uh, so which is a prime ideal? So we see that a n is indeed irreducible. I should maybe say that this um, fact uh, that if x is irreducible, then its ideal is a prime ideal, is actually the main reason why we will want later to restrict attention to irreducible algebraic sets, to affine varieties. Because uh, it is very useful for us that the ideal is a prime ideal. The main reason is the following. So, So it's a remark. So if x is an affine algebraic set, so we will consider the following. Uh, the so-called affine coordinate ring A of x, so I, mean, I assume that x is maybe contained in kx1 in uh, an. So ax will be just defined to be all polynomials divided by the ideal of x. And we will use this, uh, this ring very much because we can view this as somehow functions on x. And we use this to make maps between such things. So uh, these are somehow our functions on x. And so we will make a lot of use of this. And the point is that if x is irreducible, x is irreducible, if and only if ix is a prime ideal, if and only if uh, this ax is an integral domain. And it's very useful for us that uh, this thing is an integral domain because it's much easier to work with integral domains than with rings which have zero divisors. In particular, as we will want to consider the so-called <coughs> Uh, the field of fractions of A of x, which uh, doesn't even exist if uh, it's not an integral domain. Okay. Are what? Are yeah. yeah, well, these are polynomial functions somehow. But I mean, we will come back to that. So, you know, you find, if you think of it, that these are all the functions from x to k, which can be obtained as restrictions of polynomials to x. Okay, and these are the kind of natural functions that one might want to consider. Uh, but we will not in the moment do this, but this is the main reason why we uh, later will restrict our attention to irreducible varieties, uh, irreducible algebraic sets and call them varieties. I mean, <clears throat> Yeah, I want to very briefly also touch some other subject which we will not deal with, so just that you have seen it when we finally do it. So I want to just say two words about dimension. 
So when uh, there's a concept of dimension for a fine algebraic set, and uh, which uh, surprisingly turns out to work rather nicely and similarly to what one would expect, in spite of the fact that the definition will look rather strange to you. And uh, so again, we introduce the dimension more generally for uh, so-called, for Noetherian topological spaces. Um, so, so we have a, But you know, you think of uh, a fine algebraic set. And um, <clears throat> the idea, the basic idea is uh, very simple. So say if x is irreducible and y is say be also irreducible and y is a closed subset in x, then somehow y is smaller than x and we would really feel that you know, y is given by some closed condition in x, it should really have a smaller dimension. So then we want that the dimension of y is strictly smaller than the dimension of x. And somehow, if we cannot fit another irreducible closed subset between y and x, we would want that the difference of the dimension is precisely one. And this somehow should define the dimension. So, um, so one can actually turn this into a definition. As I said, we are not going to work with this now. We will I introduce it once, and then in the second half of this course, we will actually work with it and, be, and show that one actually can prove something about it. But in the moment, we don't have the tools. So let x be a, say, non-empty uh, irreducible topological space. The dimension which we call deem x of x is a uh, the largest n, so that we have some chain of closed subsets, so is the largest n is an ascending chain empty set x0 strictly contained in x1, strictly contained in x2, and so on. And finally, we come to xn, which is equal to x. Um, of irreducible closed subsets. And um, uh, if x is not irreducible, if just Noetherian space not irreducible, we take the maximum of the dimensions of the irreducible components. So if x is in Noetherian topological space, ah. then dimension of x equal to the maximum of the dimensions of the irreducible components of 
of x. Now this I think reminds me of the fact that I did not, or that I at least don't recall, but I don't think I properly did it when we have had this uh, theorem and definition. I somehow forgot the definition part. So we had the statement that uh, uh, if, so I just make this as a side remark uh, to have it once completely on the blackboard. So we had x in a Unitarian topological space. Then we had that x can be written as x1 union union xr, finite decomposition with the xi irreducible closed subsets. And this was unique if we assumed that xi is not contained in xj for i different from j. And then under these assumptions, so in we, when we have this thing, this unique decomposition, the xi are called the irreducible components of x. So now this definition here makes sense. We, if we have an irreducible topological space, the dimension is the length of the longest chain of um, the largest n for the length of a chain of uh, irreducible closed subsets. And if x is not irreducible, we just you know, do this for each irreducible, irreducible component of x, and we take the maximum of the dimensions. And that's the dimension of the whole thing. So. This definition in the moment is not very practicable because we don't have any idea how to find out something about all closed subsets of an affine algebraic set. So there are very few things that we can say. We can say that first the points P in AN have dimension zero because you know the chain will only consist of the point itself, and then that's it. That's it. You know, as it also should be a point has dimension zero, and um, it's also comforting that a one has dimension one, and this we actually proved the other time without seeing it, namely. We had seen that uh, the only irreducible closed subsets of A1 are the points and A1 itself. Because we have seen that the Closed subsets are the empty set, uh, the finite sets, and A1. And so you know, if you have a finite set of points, it's not irreducible unless it's just one point. So we only have this. So the maximal length of a chain is you know, the empty set contained in a point contained in the whole of A1. So the dimension is 1. And something which we cannot see, but which obviously uh, is necessary for the whole thing, to make any kind of sense is that, uh, so we in the moment cannot, we cannot prove but we will later, um, but it's true, uh, that a n has dimension n. If you look at this dimension, this definition, this is not so clear, but it's evident that the dimension of n is at least n. So it's easy. It's bigger or equal to n. I mean, you can, you know, if for instance you are in two dimensional space, you know, what kind of chain can you take? You can start with a point 
then you take a line through the point, and then you take the whole thing. So this is a chain of length two. You can do the same thing in a n. You take a point, you take a one-dimensional uh, sub linear subspace, then a two-dimensional linear subspace, and each of these are uh, a fine algebraic sets, and they are irredu I mean, you can see that they are irreducible. <coughs> well, maybe that is not so evident, but uh, <coughs> well, it is quite evident, but anyway, as we are not proving it. <coughs> so let me just write it down. So we have, um, because We have an uh, because we have an ascending chain. Um, so point zero is contained, say, in the zero set of the variables x two to x n. This is contained in. Uh, and always strictly, zero set of x3 uh, to xn, and so on. Zero set of xn contained in an, and this is a chain of length n. It's not completely evident that uh, these are all irreducible. We will see this late soon anyway. But if you believe that for the moment, we have a, an ascending chain of length n uh, of irreducible, irreducible closed subsets. And so we get the dimension of an is at least n. And later, we will uh, prove uh, really something about the theory of dimensions. We'll see that. Uh, there's actually a lot that one can say. But uh, for this, we need to, to develop quite a few tools. <laughs> OK, so now we just go. So this was just some kind of preview for uh, what we want to do. So now uh, we come to another big theorem, which is. Um, the Hilbert Nullstellen satz. So let me, this is another section kind of. So this is again uh, after the uh, well-known German mathematician Hilbert, David Hilbert. And Nullstellensatz is a, is a German word, which, uh, which is how everybody calls it, in spite of uh, you know, just because that's how Hilbert called it. And this means theorem of zeros. Okay. But you know, if you look in a book, it's called like that, not like that, even if it's an English book. I mean, <clears throat> null means zero, null stelle means the place where the zero is, and satz means theorem. So it's all easy. <clears throat> now, so this is uh, about the relations of ideals and their zero sets. So. Remember, if we have an ideal, in the polynomial ring, we can associate to it, uh, we have its zero set, which is in a fine algebraic set On the other hand, if x is uh, in a fine algebraic set, we uh, can associate to it the ideal of x, 
which is an idea. So if you want, you can say we have two maps between, we have maps between the ideals and the fine algebraic sets in both directions. So we have here, say which way do we want it, a fine algebraic sets in the end. And here we have the ideals in K x1 to xn. And we have two maps. We can associate to an affine algebraic set its ideal. And we have a map in the other direction, which associates to it an ideal its zero set. Now, you know, in the best of all worlds, you could hope that, for instance, these are inverse bijections. So that we, you know, somehow talking about the fine algebraic sets is the same as talking about ideals. Just, uh, you know, you can go backwards and forwards. We have to figure out whether that's true. And it actually turns out to be not quite true. So are these inverse to each other? If not, uh, what is the precise relation? So we had already seen, this was an exercise we know, that if we take the zeros, so if x is in a fine algebraic set, and we take the zero set of the ideal of x, this is equal to x. Oh, more generally, if x is any subset of a n, then uh, the zero set of the ideal of x is the closure of x. So we know at least that if we start from here, we go here and here, we get the identity. You know, and, uh, but it turns out we'll see it's not true uh, that in the other way we get the identity that the uh, ideal of the zero set of an ideal J, so J ideal, is equal to J. It is clear again, but it's again obvious, but clearly we have that the ideal of the zero set of J uh, contains J. This is just by definition, because what do we have here? We have the zero set of J is a set of all points where all polynomials, what? We will see, I write it a little bit larger, we will see, this is not true. Um, but uh, in one direction it's true, the ideal of the zero set of an ideal is that ideal. And I also, even in the other direction, it's almost, there's some part of it true. If we take uh, so it's, it is not, this will not be true that this is equal. But we will see that it's almost, that at least this is true. This we see immediately and I was just explaining it. So the zero set of J is a set of all points where all elements of J vanish. And the ideal of the zero set is a set of all polynomials which vanish on this set. As the elements of J vanish on this set, J belongs to it, okay? 
So it's, uh, this is just by, by pure uh, elementary logic, uh, this is true. Okay, but I, as I said, the other inclusion will in general be not be true, and the answer will be a little bit more interesting. But first, before one does that, ah, our time is almost up, let me see. Um, but we can ask a simpler question first. First, we ask a simpler question. Namely, um, when is it true that the zero set of an ideal is the empty set? or when it's not the empty set. So we know that the zero set of the whole polynomial ring is the empty set because in particular this polynomial ring con contains the constant polynomial one which vanishes nowhere. So, and the first theorem which is the, uh, the weak form of the null Sternsatz, says that this is the only ideal for which the zero set is the empty set. So, um, so let I Contain, strictly contain in x1 the x1 to xn be a proper ideal. So if an ideal, if I have an ideal which is not equal to the whole of the polynomial ring, then the zero set of i is non-empty. Okay. So. So this is a, a surprisingly difficult theorem. Um, it's uh, so difficult that I don't want to prove it now. So um, it's not, I mean, it's not outrageously difficult, but the proof is very long. I mean, it would take me maybe, uh, I don't know, two lectures or something to prove it. Um, so in the notes, there is actually proof, but it's in, in the chapter about dimension. So if you have time and you are interested, I will prove it then, because then we have developed the tools to do this. If now we have to do it from scratch, it would, be, it would take a very long time. So we, for the moment, assume this result, and then we will prove, uh, as a consequence, the strong form of the Nullstellensatz, which uh, tells you about the precise relation between ideals and their zero sets. And um, okay, and then uh, that's we will do next time. Okay, thanks. <laughs>